Let's get started. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here or for joining us in the uh, online round. Uh, we're here to discuss events that happened in 1961 and 1962 at UT Austin, nearby and beyond. Uh, I'm happy to be here. My name is Alberto Martinez. I'm a professor in UT's history department where I've worked since 2005. Joining us today is Dr. Ted Gordon as a discussant. He is Executive Director of Commemorative and Contextualization Projects, in the Office of the Executive Vice President and Provost. He's also Associate Professor of American, African, and, and African Diaspora Studies. He is formerly UT's Vice Provost for Diversity. To my right is Jeannie Reinert Graves, she studied history and journalism at UT, worked extensively at the Daily Texan. After graduating in 1962, she was an amusements editor at the Beaumont, Texas Journal, staff writer at Science Digest in New York City. Jeannie co-founded a public relations firm, Zinn, Graves, and Field, and published New Jersey directories for 30 years. She's also a member of the History Department's Visiting Committee. To her right, David Crossley studied at Rice and Stephen F. Austin University before studying journalism at UT, 1959 to 1962. He too wrote for the Daily Texan, became associate ed editor of The Ranger, which was the number one college magazine nationwide. David became a counterculture figure hanging out with Gilbert Shelton, Janis Joplin, and others. <laughs> After leaving UT, he was roommate of filmmaker, filmmaker Ter Terry Gilliam. David worked in Help Magazine with Harvey Kritzman, founder of Mad Magazine, cartoonist Robert Crumb, John Cleese, and others. And he continued to work in journalism. He became founder and past president of Houston Tomorrow and co-founder and past chair of Blueprint Houston. Uh, getting started to me, um, Dr. Martin Luther King's visit to our campus on March 9th, 1962, seems very distant, 61 years ago before I was born. So it's fascinating that there are individuals still around who are right here at UT in 1962, such as these two past reporters of the Daily Texan, and who still talk lucidly about their memories. Watching student activism, Dr. King's visits, the protests against segregation on campus, on the drag, and even in Mississippi. So here's the background. In 1942, UT Regent Orville Bullington said, there is not the slightest danger of any Negro attending the University of Texas, regardless of what Franklin D. or Eleanor Roosevelt or the Supreme Court says. So long as you have a Board of Regents with as much intestinal fortitude as this one. Six years later, June 1950, the Supreme Court decides Sweat versus Painter, UT must admit Black students. Unanimous ruling that justices dis declare separate Negro facilities are not equal to UT facilities. UT administrators, however, interpret the ruling very narrowly to exclude undergraduate students. Until in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, Supreme Court rules, Black students cannot be excluded. In 1956, more than a year later, finally, a few Black undergrads are at UT. In 1959, David arrives. Black students were still excluded from many aspects of university life. No professors at UT were Black. Black people still could not enter many businesses on Guadalupe. Most dorms were still all white, and white cowboy minstrels still sang the eyes of Texas with their faces painted Black. By December of the next year, 1960, UT faculty in classics, history, and languages wrote, we protest 
racial segregation policies of certain businesses on the drag, we can remain silent no longer. In that context, a month later, one of the editors of the Daily Texan asked David to please cover some of the public protests that were happening along Guadalupe Street in front of the Texas Theater and the Varsity Theater. Uh, so my first question to David is tell us about how you got to cover that story and what are your impressions about that moment? I didn't anticipate that one. I don't have any idea how I got assigned to that particular story at that time. But you did have but your I, friend Lopez. Was and and my, my good friend David Lopez, who later assigned me to go to Jackson, Mississippi, may or may not have been the one who sent me down to, to the Texan and the Varsity Theaters to see what was going on there. But, um, and I, I just want to say that the, you have to understand that the background, this is 1961. And the background is that in 1961, things were really starting to happen in Mississippi and Alabama as the Freedom Riders were launched and started, went down into Jackson. And uh, as a group of students at Ber Berglund High School in Macomb, Mississippi, walked out because one of their number had been uh, expelled from school for attending a, a protest somewhere. And they decided they just wouldn't have that. And uh, more than 100 of them walked out and kind of started that whole thing, the high, high school kids of, uh, of protesting at, at schools and so on. So, so with all that going on, um, things started to happen here. And what was the first thing that I'm aware of to happen was that, that, that the, bo both of these theaters had protests going on in front of them for three or four days, I believe. And, um, and uh, they were, it was a mixture of people. So it was some, uh, it was college, black college kids and, and a group of people of nuns and, and others from uh, I think Guadalupe Cathedral or something. I've forgotten the name of it, I have to look, but, uh, but they were protesting the fact that the theater was, um, was segregated now in, in, uh, I don't remember whether that meant black people just couldn't go there at all, or whether, or there whether it meant there were different hours, or there was a different section inside. I'm not sure because, it, and it's never stated in the story what that was about. So um, it, things got started there, and they were pretty peaceful. There was a, a, a small amount of people driving by in cars who yelled both in favor and in in opposition to to what was going on on the sidewalk there. There was some struggle over the, the theater tried to put tape on the sidewalks to move the line of people away from their, their entrance. And there was big brouhaha about that, as I recall. Um, the debate about whether they had the right to put that tape there, yeah, whether they right. had paid $3,000 uh, fee in order to put it there. And then the theater moved it back a bit. Yeah. So so it was, you know, it was just starting to get gnarly and people didn't have any idea how to do this kind of stuff <laughs> at that time. Um, but I, 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 I just remember it's funny that I, I had been plucked out of, you know, whatever, because you're supposed to do what you're told with the daily text. And when you're assigned to something, you just go do it. And I wasn't really aware of all of this angst and so forth. I wasn't aware that that was actually going on. I, I can't believe I wasn't, but I don't remember being aware. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I covered it, and I and I, I must say I was thrilled to read this story again. I think, hey, well, yeah, you did a pretty good job. You know, you, you kind of got this right, and you painted little pictures of what the lines looked like and so on. And uh, uh, anyway, that so that that's how things got started, and that's how I got obviously my first uh, exposure. To, to all of this. Trip. Now, there were uh, students for direct action participating there, Episcopal students, uh, students from Hudson Tilliston. But you told me that the majority of people in line were actually white, right? And I told you that. And then I read that sentence this morning. And, and I think, well, maybe that's not true. I, mm -hmm. I just that's what I kind of remember. But, you know, it's 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 shocking how your brain fails you about stuff like that that you think would have been really pretty exciting and you know but uh, yeah i read that then the, in february this is in january in february um uh white supremacist people staged uh, a countering
protests in front of the same theaters. Oh. 450 people in the Austin, in the American Statesman reported that they were there uh, standing with their signs saying, uh, you know, that, 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 that they did not believe in the political or social equality of Black people. So they shouldn't they, they should they shouldn't have to be in the you know uh, in, in the same circumstance. Uh, moving on, uh, jumping ahead to what you what you mentioned, what you mentioned about uh, Macomb, Mississippi, had not quite happened yet in early sixty one. It happens in August. So by August 30, 1961, 16 year old black student Brenda Travis plus two others they go to the Greyhound bus station to buy a tickets at the white counter where they were not about to be. They're arrested and jailed. On October 4, Brenda was kicked out of her high school. So 119 Black students walked out of the school with her. Now, this is an all-Black school that, as you told me, otherwise I wouldn't know how to white superintendent. So Black students were ordered to sign pledges not to protest. In other words, you're college students. We want to keep you out of protest. And the students refused to protest. I mean, refused to sign those pledges. So on October 12, they walked out again. And some of these students wanted to, pro it wasn't just arbitrary protest, they were trying to work on voter registration. How do we get Black people to actually, to actually vote, make a difference? So at the time, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which as uh, David tells me was known as SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, had been formed in 1960 and was active in trying to organize these things. Somehow, this UT student, David Crossley, was assigned to travel all the way up to Macomb, Mississippi, which has been described presently by historians as one of the deadliest places in America for Black people. To travel right there and hang out and stay overnight at the, the house of the members of the Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Tell us, what do you remember about your visit to Mississippi? Well, I know I got on a bus, and I know I got on a bus with a huge 4 by 5 camera, which is what there was back in the day, and I must have had lots of plates, you know, loaded film. Uh, I don't remember how, so Macomb was 80 miles away from Jackson, and I do not remember going from Macomb to Jackson or what it was that drove us there. I know that if you read uh, stuff that's going on in the Texan at this time, you get it that there was already a, a tension and they were starting, the Texan is reporting about things that are going on in Macomb, including the, the Berglund High School and other things. But uh, so, so there's a bunch of stuff starting to go on and the Texan is starting to report it on. And at the same time, at UT, the student council was led by Maurice Olean at that time, uh, is starting to take to get serious about what is segregation, what, what what do we object to, and what you know what has to happen here. So there's lots of stories in the Texan that appear on the same day as things were going on in Jackson that are going on in in Austin as well. So so anyway, so I went there and I and I I have, I have no memory really of Macomb at all. But I do have a great big memory of Jackson, um, and where what we went to cover was that the Mississippi State Fair was going to enter into its black per person's period. It, has seven, it had seven days of uh, white people only, and then they would take a day to unload a whole bunch of the exhibits and take them out, and then the next day the black people could come in. And you can go to the fair or what's left of, yeah, what's left black of the fair, back. right. And and it's a kind of you know what was there that they took out I don't know but but um so so I was staying at that time I was staying in this house that the that SNCC occupied as their office that had a lot of people living in it and you know you can imagine what that was like and and uh, and I slept on a couch for I guess four nights and uh, and they fed me it was wonderful I mean and it was mostly black people there oh, mostly all, black all black people. all all yeah, of you yeah. one white guest yeah and so it was yeah you know it was it was a, it was just like total revelation to me everything about all of this stuff that you were in an underground situation an yeah. underground fight and then they took me to the go over to the fair where you know pretty quickly I saw dogs attack people and I thought what is you know going on uh, police uh, dogs police dogs yeah. And and I and I'm not sure. It seems I, 
I, I, that may have been the first time police dogs were used to to attack people at a, in a protest like that. But so what they were trying to do is to keep black people from going to the fair on that day, because it was it was terrible. They wanted to go the early days when it was all still there. So. So that was pretty successful and very, very few people actually went to the fair on that day. But, the, the, you know, all the riot was happening out in the parking lot where they chase people up railroad tracks. And, to, you know, it was just it was I can only remember chaos. It's all I can remember, but I don't remember the details at except for watching these dogs. At one point you described, say, 300 black people running as the dogs are chasing them yeah right that's yeah so it was a whole bunch of people gathered there but they were the people i guess that were on their way to the fair mm -hmm. and then just got caught up in, mm -hmm. in what was happening so uh that went on for a couple of days and um uh, and the texan we, and we got some pictures which i uh I yeah we can we can put them up uh so so uh just show show go to the slides for a second I'm, I'm glad you bring it up that way. It comes up as a spontaneous thing when it's needed in the discussion rather than me arbitrarily the choosing, bottom. It's yeah, choosing a I moment. Totally forgot about yeah. All right, so here we are. That just, just slowly, so, so this first image is uh, from that moment in February, 1961 now, David had been covering the uh, uh, protests in front of theater, theater, uh, the theaters in favor of integration in January now in, in uh, February, opposite protests show up. I do not believe in the social or political equality of our two separate races. Uh, go to the next slide. Now, this is one of the photos this that in uh, Jackson, yeah. David was taken and somehow sending to you the Daily to, Texan. I cannot for the life of me figure out how this happened because first I'm taking pictures with a big four by five camera. And then somehow I got the film developed in Jackson, yeah. Mississippi. I probably went to a newspaper office, I would guess, but I don't remember. And then somehow transmitted them, you know, long before there was anything. It was, it was a kind of a funny teletype machine. And I think it made a print that was like a fax machine. You know, it wasn't very high quality, but it was good enough. And the, and the Texan ran three of these the day after it happened, you know, yeah. which to me is mind boggling. Let, let's, let's see the slides so we can eliminate the images. So here we have another photo he took of, you know, the black people and the kids and uh, one of the dogs. Next slide. Uh, no, previous slide. At some point they were singing, we shall overcome. And Next. it's funny, I swear I, that fellow on the in the foreground, yeah, go back, is so familiar to me that I think he must show up in other pictures of this time. I don't know, but the guy in the back looks like Sidney Poitier. Uh, uh, <laughs> I keep finding these yeah, so interesting right. pictures because. All right, uh, and, and you can you can eliminate the photos for now. Let me just clarify: an interesting thing came up when I uh, spoke with Dave. He told me that. Uh, that since there was this turnover from the white phase, the first several days that were all white, and then the black days of the state fair, by the time you got there, it was the black days. Yeah. And what the black people protesters from SNCC were trying to achieve was to stop the black people from supporting the racist fair. In other words, the black people were trying to stop the black people from going in. The police got in the way and suddenly was attacking all the black people. Yeah. It's, it's sort of mind boggling to think about, you know, that what they were trying to do was not going to the fair. It wasn't like they were trying to break in on the wrong day or something. It was like they were just trying to get people not to go. And the police were upset about that. And there was some quote in here of one cop saying, we did this just for them. Why aren't they appreciative of this, you know? <laughs> yeah, we did all this just for you. All right. So, uh, here's an, an interesting uh, 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 detail from uh, Macomb, Mississippi. Now, uh, the state fair is in Jackson, right? Right. Yes. Right. Yeah, but 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 previously, regarding your your stint at Macomb, Bob Zellner was a field secretary for the Nonviolent Coordinating Committee (SNCC), working on voter res registration there. Marched to City Hall, beaten up by an angry mob. And uh, Zellner said, nobody, in other words, the people who were there, made that decision 
who didn't realize that there was a good chance that they would be killed. In other words, the protest. In my first 36 months with SNCC, six or eight of my comrades were in fact lynched. They were murdered by racists. So we knew that that would be a possibility. Now, when you are in Jackson, you, one of your reports were that uh, seven black people were arrested for uh, disturbing the peace. Uh, the people were bitten, pants were torn, uh, bloodied, um, uh, pull, put into police wagons. Um, uh, that, that was the first time you had seen that kind of thing happening no. in America. It was just a surprise. It felt like in being in another world or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, because I mean, everything was so peaceful earlier in Austin. It really was, you know, it wasn't any fighting or anything like that. No police. I don't even remember police being involved at all. Mm -hmm. I guess I, I, there was a moment when a, when a cop showed up and they were asking him to move the tape and, and he said, and they didn't do it. But, uh, but there was no, no. Yeah, this was the first time I'd ever seen anything like that, unless I'd seen it on television, which, you know, I don't remember. One and of the interesting things that I that I I want to put in here was that seeing these Texans from that the period, there's a lot of stuff going on in the Texan that happens to mention things in Macomb and Jackson and others because the student council was trying to pass some sort of resolution about integration and and there was a big struggle about that and, and there's, there's one moment where where at this demonstration of about the about that the guy in the background in this picture happens to be Kerry O'Quinn who was the art director of the ranger and he's the one who got us all fired and you know and I kept seeing all these people they were writing things, Hoyt Purvis and you know, they're all and Sam Kinch and Jim Hyatt. And they were they were all writing about this at the time. So 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 obviously the Texan staff was completely into this whole thing, mm -hmm. way ahead of me. And like I say, I don't know why I got chosen. Although David Lopez and I went on to be very close friends over time. And so I don't know, he saw something in me, I guess, that he thought would pull it off <laughs> anyway so and now there's one more article that you wrote in that sequence which was the one about the failed protest at the football game right yeah, yeah. tell us a, a word about that one and i only I, I i only saw this this morning thank you for sending it to me so i i haven't even read it so i, I managed to get it printed out and thinking i'd be here in plenty of time to read it so so all I can tell you is that there was a protest between the, the, uh, at the football game um, and, a, and a bunch of people had planned to leave the stadium at halftime because the president of the Jackson State College was going to speak then. And he was the one who uh, caused all the brouhaha earlier when um, when the, that school threw some people out and, and uh, had a, the other thing I wrote about much earlier. So that was still going on, um, and I, I just, you know, I don't know. I don't remember this. I don't remember being in this football stadium, but of course I was. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you just knew that <laughs> that something else had happened, and that was the story. Yeah. Um, uh, this is. It was an interesting uh, ongoing complaint here at UT Austin that the students on the Daily Texan would complain that the university prides itself in being ahead in things such as integration and being there first. And yet there were black football players in other universities, but not in this one. So they would actually uh, make that kind of, that kind of public statement. Um, we'll talk a little bit about then your transition to the Rangers, uh, uh, maybe a little afterwards. Another thought you have? No, I was just remembering this yeah. this part about when they couldn't. We shall overcome keeps popping up, and the way I treat it is just horrible. I keep referring to it as a quote freedom song, mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever. But but they couldn't. They were trying to get the students to sing "We Shall Overcome," and they wouldn't do it. And so this whole protest just failed at the football game. I mean, nothing actually happened in the end. So it was yeah. a little early for I guess that kind of public stuff where you kind of spontaneously get people to mm -hmm. start doing things. So now, meanwhile, here at back at UD Austin, uh, even though there were some few 
black students on campus, what, maybe uh, 200 or so, any estimate by 19, end of 61, any sense of? Uh, when the original 1956 precursors, as I recall them, yeah. Colonel Holland, um, by the time we get to the 60s, there's probably, well, there's graduate students who are black and there are also undergraduates who are black as well. So a couple hundred. A couple hundred. And uh, the, the problem I'm going at UT was that in terms of public relations for progressive liberal people who did want integration, the university could show, oh, you want uh, black students in dorms? There's a couple there and a couple there. So for example, there were a few male dorms that were uh, in quotations integrated, San Jacinto D and San Jacinto F and the Brackenridge dorm D had a few black male students, but black females were not allowed in the all white female dorms. I was in Kinsaw in 1962. Excellent, because that's that's where we're going. We're yeah. going we're going to King Solving right now. Oh, okay. Well, in well, yeah. well so, then you need uh, to uh, also uh, add that uh, in, between the time your sister you went there and your sister went there five years later, they had women were not the only people in King Solving. They were allowing men into it, mm -hmm. and uh, and as I recall, your sister wasn't allowed to live there because of that. So. This wasn't just about black people, it was about a whole range of weirdness that. Uh... So here's a, 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 a interesting uh, thing that became a, a legal contest here at UT Austin, because the question is nationwide, there is this, pro, this push that David has been outlining, for example, the protests, the voter registration rallies, the freedom writers, uh, the, uh, the sit-ins, so uh, cafeterias in different places, black people are trying to just sit down and be included at movie theaters. Dude, we're just gonna go peacefully somewhere, peacefully, and try to be accepted there. At the movie theater, they would stand in line, go all the way to the ticket, try to buy a ticket. And when the person said, we don't sell tickets for Negroes here, uh, they would go back in line and do the line again and ask him, have you reconsidered your <laughs> policy on selling tickets to Negroes yet? And they would be denied and they would go back in line. They would do that again and again and again, trying to just have that push, trying to be included. But then when we talk about UT, we get the impression that, well, the first student was let in here, another first student was let in there. And the question becomes, where's the racism? Where's the active structural racism whereby people were being excluded? Because what we get can be an infinite march of the first this and the first that and the first that, first black student of engineering, first black student of this. And, and one of the issues that was ongoing at UT in the fall of 1961 was the sit-ins. In other words, the black female students said, we're not gonna have it anymore. And we're gonna go sit in the white spaces where we're not allowed on campus. So October 19, 1961 at 7 15 p.m., roughly 50 black students entered the lobby of Kin Solving Dorm to protest that they were barred from public areas. Resident counselor walks around stunned. What are these people doing standing here? Uh, Miss Natalie Tower Towns. North Wing residence counselor moved in and out of the chairs, leaning over and asking the visitors, are you aware that this is a public area? I must ask you to leave. Notice the irony, it's a public area, so I'm gonna ask you to leave. Not you. I must ask you to leave, because it's a public area. In other words, it's okay to be black and private. As each group refused to move, Ms. Towns walked to another corner of the room she left to make several telephone calls. A Negro student said he believed the demonstration to be spontaneous. We are not backed by the students for the direct action. We are not backed by the NAACP, Nikita Khrushchev, or anybody like that. I would say we were all incensed by that article in Thursday's Texas, a story about uh, not violating properly constituted authority. I would hate very much to get kicked out of the school, but these rules are just not right. He said, none of the Negroes present would give their names. Some identified themselves as 
Elizabeth Taylor, Mary Britt, Jack, Jackie Robinson. So these girls are being kicked out and they're just giving these fake names. So at 8.15 p.m., the demonstrators wrote en masse as if by a signal and moved out of the dorm. We have to go study now, a Negro girl explained. The group traveled to the Almitris living room, and then they started their pep rally Texas fight. So this is in October of 1961. Right then, the dean of students puts these many students on disciplinary probation threatening that if they violate probation, they will be expelled. October 1961, that same month, these students begin to prepare to sue the university. In that context, Martin Luther King, in that background, gets invited to come to campus to help with the full integration of the university. By January 1962, three Black students sue the university, Maudie Eights, Cheryl Griffin, and Leroy Sanders. Dorms are part of the educational structure of UT, so they must let Blacks in. The regents reply, however, that students have not been stopped from intellectual commingling, which is what the Supreme Court wanted to allow. You can intellectually commingle, not necessarily, in place. So now in that context, what, what had been frustrating among many things Dr. King was this idea that the way racism will be solved would just be by waiting. You must wait, you must wait, be patient, time will solve this, just wait a little longer, it's not the right time. These things take time. And in that context, Dr. King is invited to campus, uh, an invitation that was uh, protested by UT officials as described in the Dallas Morning News in uh, October of 1961. And, uh, our Daily Texan reporter, Jeannie Reinert, was the person who wrote the story covering Dr. King's actual visit. She was there when Dr. King spoke to faculty and when Dr. King uh, spoke at the ballroom of the Texas Union. So go ahead, uh, Jeannie, give, you, give us a uh, background and your impressions of that. I'd be pleased of to. that moment. I'd also like to thank you for setting up the program in the Institute for Historical Studies to, to tape it and make it available for future historians, perhaps. And <clears throat> I've prepared a handout, which anybody here is welcome to use, which has a couple of very interesting, one of them is a book that was written about integrating the 40 acres, a 50-year look on it, by a graduate student at the time here, and another is a website that um, was put together by Laura McNeil Burns. And that was, a, it's devoted to stands, stand ins at Texas. And they had a reunion apparently about 2011 at Schultz's, which is very. Mm -hmm. Schultz's German <laughs> beer. Schultz's German beer garden was the host. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And she's just, she got upset that documentation she had from the time wasn't the same as what people were saying their memories were. So she put together this website. It's very interesting. I'd never heard about it. So I want to tell you about actually covering Martin Luther King's speech. My impressions of his speech as well within the timeline of his life. One thing that I noticed right away is that he was so young. You know, he was only 33 years old when he came to campus, mm -hmm. and he had already successfully led the Montgomery bus boycott. That lasted 385 days, and it was all they were asking was to be able to ride on the bus anywhere, as opposed to always having to sit in the back. And, and, and in Montgomery, uh, he said that he, the, the police provided no protection. No. Uh, you know, his house was bombed twice, his family house. So so uh, this is a, a highly racist part of the country. Very, very racist. And not only was he famous at the time, but as you mentioned, he already had his house bombed and he was attacked in Harlem and almost killed. He spent weeks in the hospital. That was all about 1960. A mentally ill black woman stabbed him with a letter opener on the chest, almost killing him. 
And in 1960, two years before he came here, he was arrested in Atlanta for leading a demonstration. Everybody else was let go, but he was sentenced to four months at hard labor. Well, a lot of people were very nervous that in the state prison, which had a lot of white inmates, that he might be actually killed. And the presidential campaign was going on. It was Nixon versus Kennedy. And Nixon decided he would not intervene. But the Kennedys really went all out and they pushed every button they could, made telephone calls. And within days, he was, he was released. Um, that was very helpful. But another thing that we really noticed when he was in Austin was that he traveled alone. If you look at pictures, he's always surrounded by people. But he came here alone. And that was just part to me of, of being brave. And he was his um, at this little short meeting, sort of a swore way for some faculty members with King. Uh, I was allowed to attend it. And he had an enormous vocabulary. For example, he would use the word like elucidate instead of explain because he knew that was what his, where his audience was. I didn't realize it at the time, but the faculty was not integrated. He probably did recognize that. He probably did. Another thing that happened was that the Texas Union Speakers Bureau, which was nervous about his uh, being at the Driscoll. Normally, that's where speakers were housed. They didn't want to do it. So a person whose name is all over the Texas Union now, Shirley Bird Perry, was working for them at the time. And they told her, go out, make a room ready for him to sleep in. So she got towels and soap and they put a telephone in. They put some in other words, work. create, convert a room in the union into yes. a bedroom for this exactly. one black man. That's right. Who will be there by himself, yeah, to just yes. overnight, yeah. Yes, because they were also, you know, she was interviewed about this in 2011 by the Lubbock Avalanche Journal. And she said that the Driscoll at that time would let, quote, some black people stay overnight. But I personally think, having lived in that time, that they were nervous he'd be turned away. Shirley said that they were concerned that people would make comments to him. Well, maybe. <laughs> we're doing this for your own protection. We're doing all of this for you. All of this exclusion is a favor to you. That's right. That's right. Until the time is help. ready. Now, <clears throat> he was extraordinarily eloquent. And for the speech itself, if I might quote from it, and there were more than 1,200 people. It was an overflow crowd in the main ballroom of the Texas Union. And they were all very anxious to hear him. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered a sermon to the audience, and the audience delivered him a standing ovation. He was marvelous. <clears throat> he started out introducing the idea of that the Negro slaves came over in 1619 as depersonalized cogs in the vast plantation machine. And that's, that's how they got here. They didn't come voluntarily. So he said that the major way argument used for segregation was one, man is made in the image of God. Two, God is not a Negro. Therefore, the Negro is not a man. Pretty awful, huh? It's pretty grim. <clears throat> he also said that there should be a second Emancipation Declaration. And he was pressing, at that time, President Kennedy to do that. It was never done. He wanted all of the uh, accommodations, particularly veterans, to be declared for it to be unconstitutional for them to be segregated. That did not happen. But he said there were two myths surrounding segregation. One, just like you talked about, was that time could solve the problem. He said time is neutral. 
only timeless effort can solve the problem. The second was a belief that education could solve it. He said, yes, there needs to be education, but that's not gonna solve it. It's gonna take the work of all three branches of the federal government. It's gonna take the work of the Negro himself, the white South, and that's what's gonna get the change. And he was so eloquent. He said, the law might keep a man from lynch. The law <clears throat> may not make a man love me, but it could keep him from lynching me. The audience loved it. They just clapped wildly. So he preached nonviolence and he said it was very effective because it frustrated people who were against you. And it was also allowed to use moral means to a moral end. During a question and answer session, Dr. King mentioned that Lyndon Johnson was chairman of the Committee on Civil Rights. He said, I have only talked to Lyndon Johnson once since he became vice president. And I was impressed with what he said. Then King paused and he said, but of course, I do recognize the difference between saying something and doing something. <laughs> yeah. Yes. He was <clears throat> um, while I was then rushed back, of course, to the Texan office to write up this, another person who was from the journalism department, Laura McNeil, was outside interviewing people. One of the questions you asked me was, were there protests on campus? She said that there were people, but they weren't students, they were older men from town of Austin who were passing out flyers that said that Martin Luther King was a communist. That was a frequent, you know, at the time, the communists were the, uh, <clears throat> you know, the bad guys. And so to call somebody a communist, that was really very helpful to, to denigrating them. And that's what Laura did. She has put together a website which deals a lot with this, and it's on this piece of paper, so you can look it up. It's very interesting because she has so much original material on it. Another thing that happened right after those protests was that Pat Rush, who, uh, who was news, the society news editor of the Daily Texan at the time, assigned a black student reporter to cover a sorority story. Pat herself was a member of a sorority, so she knew what she was doing. And sure enough, shortly, she got a call from the person at the sorority saying, is this really a reporter from the Texan? Yes, she said. It was one small, small step toward integration. That reporter, um, according to Laura Burns, was Waltha Marie Smith. Pat doesn't remember her name. But Pat, her husband, Jim Hyatt, who's with us here, and I do not recall other Black journalism students during our campus years. So it was only a month after Martin Luther King was here on campus that he gave the I Have a Dream speech in Washington, D.C. Something else happened in that year, 1963. And that's that the regents voted to be the first school in the Southwest Conference to integrate athletics. Very influenced by these protests because they really wanted them to go away. <laughs> they were not good for the university's image. They extended participation to all students. And in the next year in 1964, I just want to pause for a second, um, uh, just to clarify that it, it sounded as if you said the, the the month after he came here, he gave the I, I have a dream speech. It was, it was a year later. It was a year, year later. later. In 1964, the regents hired their first Black faculty member, Irving Perry. He taught engineering. And you think about it. That's the Perry in the Perry Castaneda Library. It was named after him. And also that year, seems a little inconsequential compared to those things, 
fraternity rush was open to, to whites. But it shows the evolution how things, more and more things happened. And the regents voted to integrate all university facilities the next, that was, they voted in the spring that in the fall, all, including dormitories, would be integrated. That was a big move. And that year, Martin Luther King won the Nobel Prize for combating racial inequality. In 1968, on April 4th, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. He was only 39 years old. What a difference. Thank you so much, Jean. Let me pass uh, to, uh, to our colleague, Professor Gordon, to open it up to his thoughts and comments or questions uh, any, any any ways that you can uh, contribute to the discussion. Well, thank you so much for those memories and observations about Dr. King's visit. Um, we've been working on the history of uh, Eamon Sweat and the first uh, black students to come to UT both as graduate students and undergraduate. Um, and we've also been kind of looking at the progress towards integration, the progress of civil rights on campus for a while now. My colleague, Dr. Um, Olivia Mena has been in the archives uh, really digging through these things. And one of the, uh, one of the events that we think is so important um, is visit Dr. King to the campus, particularly when he visited. But one of the things we found is that there's very little documentation of that visit. Um, For example, the speech, you don't actually have the speech. The, is there, have you seen any other news article? Because I've looked and the only article that I've found in, in, in three uh, search engines that I've done is yours. In other words, th there's a talk about a press conference, but Back then, the Austin American Statesman was not quite that. There were two separate newspapers. And if there is such an issue, somehow it's evaded. Do you, have you seen the event, the reports in actual? There was a media blackout around it. There was a media blackout. And that's yeah. what is, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I'm talking about Texas-wide. I did Texas-wide searches about this visit. And it was story after story by one venue, the Daily Texan. One venue, the Daily Text. Well, you know, there's a, yeah. a note in here about one of these Macomb things, the Jackson things, where where the, the, the Texan says, I, I wanted to stay an extra day, so I was allowed to stay an extra day there, and pointed out that I was the only reporter of any sort from anywhere in the country at this Jackson business, you know, which is pretty strange. Wow, know? that's also a big deal. I thought of you as the only person from UT Austin there, but you may have been the only, because that's part of the impressive thing. The Daily Tax was doing actual quality reporting back then. Fabulous. And then, and then that guy in, right in, there, David yeah, Lopez. In your, in, your, um, uh, in, in your contribution, Jeannie, I want to say you did skip uh, a, a great quotation by uh, by Dr. King, you can read it out yourself since you were there to, oh, to hear it. True. I mean, yeah, that's a crucial quotation right there. In other words, we would not know about this quotation had you not been there to write it, apparently. Go ahead. Yeah. Old man segregation is on his deathbed. The only question is how expensive the South is going to make the funeral. But he cautioned, the power of status quo are always on hand with an emergency breathing. It's so electric and so appropriate, partly to me because it so much illustrates the problem that was happening inside our university with these exclusionary white spaces. In other words, say, oh, you want integration? Okay, we're in a few black students are in three, I mean, are in three male dorms there where you're integrated. And you're like, wait a minute, what about that other dorm and that other dorm and that other dorm? The 14 male dorms on campus. What about, what about the remaining ones? What about the female dorms? Every inch of this had to be negotiated and begged for and begged for, kicking and begging. So the, the story that then, that then happens with the female dorm spaces was that because of the sit-in at King Solving, 
the unwritten rules of exclusion ended up in footprints, in newsprint, such as Black students who are female cannot be sitting in a hallway in a female dorm. Black students cannot be drinking from the water fountain in a female dorm. They cannot go into a restroom in a female dorm. They are, it, I mean, we have the university administrators communicating to students these rules and these things being passed down and being reported in the daily text, and such as Black female students can walk in, but we recommend, we strongly recommend that they don't. The university is saying we strongly recommend that they don't. And if they do, they're only to go directly to the room of the person who they are visiting and they have to shut the door. And it's only when you start eliciting, you know, elucidating and listing rule by rule by rule that you then understand why is that even at faculty council, the professors were shocked about this and they listed, they said there are all these unwritten rules of segregation that are still alive on this campus. And they complained about it and they put up a vote about it on November 21. Several black students are placed on disciplinary probation for disobeying duly constituted authority by showing up again at King Solving Dorm. November 30, 1962, UT General Faculty Council votes to end segregation policies in student housing. 308 faculty versus 34 voting, we want this to stop. And what is their vote? Unusual. The goal of the vote was to push the UT administrators. In other words, the faculty had the courage to actually try to give orders to the administrators. And then in December 1962, the UT regents issue a press release to warn the faculty professors at the UT School of Law, if you give help or advice to the three black students who have sued this university, you will be fired from UT or other disciplinary action. I mean, the, the, the degree of, of, of offensiveness, in other words, this is all hidden. If we simply look at, well, uh, at a certain date, uh, students were allowed, a certain date, everything was integrated. And we, we hide this, the, the, the pushback, the opposition. It is really gripping. So when I look back at the, 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 what Martin Luther King is fighting in the context of UT Austin is what he called token integration. So, oh. Well, you want some, okay, there we'll put one black here, one black there, there. You got you got integration. Token integration. There's a dining room where one black person ate. That's integration. And and the difference between token integration and real integration is is what was uh what was at stake here. Uh, but but I want you to go on to uh, we we have a please an yeah. intervention from uh, Alicia Hilton from the online audience. She says that media blackouts were a method adopted in Austin beginning when Austin High School received 40 black students for the first time in the fall of 1956. No one would write or talk about it and all local media cooperated. They all said to prevent the kind of violence we'd seen in Little Rock and other places the previous year. Wow. Well, it's all there, media blackout in relation to the first undergraduates precursor to become the University of Texas also. We found, I think, two newspaper articles which have conflicting data in terms of how many so-called Negroes were admitted, um, but there's no reporting whatsoever about how many Black folks actually came in the fall of 1956, and it's been very difficult for the precursors themselves to reconstitute that list of folks to really know how many came and who they were. Mm -hmm. Now they've done a fair amount of work and come up with about 70, 74 folks, but that number is still not known because these things were just not reported on. Mm -hmm. It's apropos of that that I was going to ask our guests some questions because there is no reporting uh, about this and no recording of, uh, of the speech, nor very few photos that we've been able to find of, uh, of Martin Luther King when he was here on campus. So one question I have is, is what did he, did he address the issues on the UT campus or was his talk more about uh, what was going on nationally or in the rest of the South? It was national. national. So he didn't specifically address the issues 
that he achieved. And I, I think you probably found that afterwards, I didn't know this, but at the time, because I was busy writing the story, but some black students met with him. And about six months after that, they formed a organization. What was it called? New Roads for Social Justice or something? Yeah, also I'm going to remember it on camera. <laughs> but, so the, and they said, with, with the blessing and leadership of, of Martin Luther King. And that was another question I, I had. I had not realized that he came alone. Yeah. Um, so and met. so the other question was whether or not he met with any of the other Black or local Black organizations, the NAACP, or whether there was a Southern leadership uh, I think the timing was such that he probably just met with these black students. And Shirley, when she was interviewed, said it lasted a long time. And he was probably very tired. <laughs> but you know, it it just seemed to be with, with those students because she waited outside of, of the meeting in the hall, you know, until until the meeting was complete. Dini, what about the meeting with the faculty or the reported meeting? with the press. Uh, allegedly, the, there's a, a faculty meeting, a press conference, despite the blackout, they, they did interview him, and, uh, and then the talk itself. Were you at the press conference? I think so. Yeah. And then at the faculty, did he say anything at those two meetings as opposed to the actual uh, union event? Did he say anything he distinctly rec re recollect, for example, whether it was a, about UT or about the faculty or about education in general? Do you remember the tone of, of those interactions? You know, I think at the faculty meeting, he, he was trying to establish that he was equal. And I think that, you know, it being Texas at that time, that was, you know, within the short time he had to do, I think that, that's what he did. He had to use enough were... elegant big words uh, as Malcolm, yeah. They eventually criticize as Malcolm X later Chris talked the language of the white academics to yeah. prove that he belongs in this yeah, yeah. Uh, realm. Because I did, he was pretty sure of being yeah. Texas that, that there were people there that didn't think that. Yeah. But it was also pretty short mm -hmm. because you know, the, the whole time was, was quite confined. You don't remember the faculty asked questions or it was just somebody presented him and he said a few words? Did the faculty raise their hands and ask him questions? They they might have, but you know the time was very limited. I think he was really trying to to establish um, credibility. You don't remember any other adult black men around him. I understand that he arrived no. alone, but say anybody there, no. he was in a room full of. Yes. Do you remember any female professors in the room? It might have been. There were female professors on campus. We had a couple of the journalists in the department. Um, you know, I just, it was so, just thinking of him, you know, alone like that, he was really carrying a, a lot of a really burden to, I mean, to give a speech with such trauma. At the student union ballroom seating, were the black students all sitting together? Do you remember seeing anything like that? I don't think so, but I might not have noticed either. You know, it wasn't. Yeah, it seems from the 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 impressions that both David and Jeannie have given me, a great quantity of in 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 a way the visible part of the student body was in favor of integration, Absolutely. and were shocked that it hadn't yet been fully what they called full citizenship hadn't yet been given to the to the black students on campus, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, my own memory of that, aside from any of these events, is that, is that the, this seemed absurd. How could, you, how could this be that we were separating people like that? But how, how students. could that have been the position when most of the students had come from segregated high schools or from uh, context where segregation was the, the norm. So it, is it about yeah. coming to UT where there is a different ethos or how, how, how do you account for the notion that the bulk of the student body was mm -hmm. in favor of, of integration and supportive of someone like Dr. King, 
when much of the rest of Texas society was not there at all. I, I would just guess that the, you know, your, your life when you leave high school and go to UT is on brand new life but but then you, you know you brand born, new bits of information everything is completely different you you were born in massachusetts so you yeah. had a you, and, and you had bounced around a bit so so uh and you were a part of this counterculture so at least the people you were around were were quite uh accepting and true they seem to be believers of equality or did you see a lot of talk behind the scenes of of you know the Black people should be on their own part uh, or should not be here. I just don't recall hearing anything. Anything like that. Like, just, I just, you know, I mean, it's like you're, you're so ignorant of what's going on, and then all of a sudden you're not. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, you know, I went to a all white high school. I say that in what thinking town? I'm right in, in, what town? in Houston. Yeah. I, and my only, until that, time, I mean, I, I told you this, that I, when I was like eight years old, I went to camp in Maine and my bunk mate and the bunk we slept in in the cabin was a little black boy like me, you know, eight years old. And I didn't, I used to remember his name and I just can't believe I've forgotten it, but we were friends. We got to be really good friends. And, and I don't remember it being, I just don't remember the issue. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but. I'll read a comment from the screen. We have uh, Craig Gowan's, writing the late noted Texas political columnist and humorist Molly Irvins made note of the media blackout for civil rights protests in East Texas she participated in. She considered writing a book about it and call it uh, Nobody Famous Ever Came. Writing a book about it called Nobody Famous Ever Came. Um, uh, 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 Dr. Mina, right? Now, did, do you re have you seen any evidence of the Texas journalists outside of the Daily Texan, the Texas journalists, or people in the in society actually discussing that they were putting a media blackout on Dr. King's visit, or is that just the inference you all made because of the fact that this wasn't reported this visit? There, there's several researchers that have written some things about those histories, I think another yeah. commentator noted, but I've, I've been looking, it's one of the things I've been looking for. Yeah. I think I can say a little bit about that. The next year in 1963, I went to work for the Beaumont Journal. Yeah. And at that time, uh, there were two newspapers in Beaumont. And one day, all the leadership of, the, of Beaumont walked into the editor's office. And of course, we knew that's who they were. And we were very curious about what it was. Well, it turned out that they were discussing with the editor if he would agree not to cover the story, they would begin integrating Beaumont. And the first thing they did was in my department, they integrated the drive-in movie. Well, <laughs> guess what? Nobody minded. But they they didn't want that in the press. They didn't want that discussed. Yes, yes but they didn't. They wanted to start a pre it. a precondition to us letting yeah. black people be in their car with the windows up. <laughs> right. We must have the windows ruled up. Is that we will not? This will not be discussed in the media. There is a phobia of making a spectacle. American yes. culture doesn't yes. want. And they didn't want the, what they saw in the South either with these big news stories and all the reporters coming. And very shortly thereafter, they integrated the regular mm -hmm. movie house because you know mm -hmm. no disaster occurred mm -hmm. there wasn't coverage of it mm -hmm. can i ask another question Go for it. That, that has to do with so there's there's widespread student support for integration uh at that point the big things were integration of the dorms integration of athletics as, as you said um and there's relatively widespread Faculty support for it as well. The faculty, as you said, the South Faculty Assembly votes to integrate the dormitories and to athletic integration as well. So, how is it? But, but those things don't happen basically because the regents and uh, the chancellor are opposed to it. Right? So, how is it that Martin Luther King was allowed to come to campus to speak? How, what's the politics of that? Who who made that decision? How, how did that get negotiated? Because clearly, you know, the powers that be were not 
in, in favor of the kinds of things that he was sure to talk about. And I can remember as a young boy when, you know, even as a, you know, an elementary school early teen, uh, Martin Luther King was understood to be a rabble rouser, a, a revolutionary, a, a dangerous person. So how do they decide to let him come to campus? Any ideas about that? I don't. I noticed that there was on the WARA's website, there's a person that was apparently that, that was co-sponsored with the Speakers Bureau and something called the University Religious Council. And there was a, a reference to that. And maybe they pushed for it. And, you know, the university, what kind of story would it be if they said, no, we won't let Martin Luther King uh, be on campus? You know, that, that I'm sure was unacceptable. It's also interesting that they allowed him to stand to see in the um, in the union because, of course, housing was still completely segregated at that point. Housing on campus was segregated at that point. In a way, it's uh, it's a building that probably was mostly empty at night, mm -hmm. and so it was him and a police guard, right? <laughs> I remember the article yeah. in the Avalanche, yeah. the Lubbock Avalanche. So if he leaves, he had to notify the policeman so the policeman could let him back in. So they're basically saying, uh, let's let's put a couple of of paintings and and some sheets on a on a on a little bed so that he can feel that there's a room here. But basically, he's he's alone there. It's a weird it's a weird it's a weird kind of inclusion, and it's almost worse than being in an actual hotel. Where, but, where, but just yeah. imagine if the hotel yeah. who had a reservation for him said, "No, you can't yeah. be here." That would be worse. Yeah, I mean, they understood that. <laughs> We have another comment here. Yes. Can you read it, Deanna? Sure. Uh, so another comment from uh, Alicia Hilton. Um, a big issue at the time was, uh, a quote, quote, unquote, outside agitators. Um, the idea was that news coverage might inspire protesters to come from any and everywhere. So it was better to keep quiet. Yeah, and in that context, let me take it back to David, because part of David's uh, experience here at, uh, at Texas, and now we're starting to wind down, but part of what, what happened was he was part of these cutting edge critical magazines and this uh, writing culture that did not find all sympathetic ears in the older generation. So th th they were printing thousands of issues of this thing called the Ranger, it became more popular than the, uh, what is it called, the Harvard Lampoon? Yeah, yeah uh, more popular than the Harvard Lampoon and David became associate editor. And uh, uh, there, were pr there was pressure from high administrators who felt criticized and ridiculed and mocked and, uh, 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 or just ma made fun of, what was the phrase you said that, that about uh, the, 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 the kind of phrase you guys had for shrugging? Uh, Logan, Logan Wilson, who was the chancellor at the yeah. time, we were, said, why can't you ever say anything nice about what a great job he's done, been here? So we came up with this phrase, which we made famous. Was, you're, you're off the camera. Uh, oh, David. sorry. <laughs> which was, gee, Logan Wilson, you sure has did a good job here. And we said that over and over, and it started to appear in the newspaper. And it just was like a jo huge joke, you know, but which was not what they wanted at but all. Eventually, a four-letter word uh, snuck past the uh -huh. the editors, including Dave, including a word that involves the letter F. Yeah. And that word led to Dave and the three others, uh, the art director, the main editor, the et cetera, circulation person to be to be removed from this job. Tell us about that moment and your interactions with the people uh, who, who were part of that. Culture. Well, it's kind of hard to imagine it now, but at the time the Ranger was, was I mean, we were selling 9,000 copies of the thing on campus every when, as soon as it came out. It was a pretty big deal. And, and it was also, the Ranger was sort of part of a party ethic, which is why Janis Joplin was involved, because she liked to go to parties. And, and, uh, and, and I read that back in those days, she'd be singing at the union and nobody cared, or in front of the union. Like, right. she was nearly oh, a nobody. Oh, she was, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. And she was playing. She was a, in a little band. What do you call those little things that go to the parks court or something? Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, and she was a, she was a beatnik. Okay, that's what we were doing. In and those he was dating Shelton at a time, right? No, they were just good no, friends. They were just good friends. Yeah, uh, right. We so. have 
sorry, we have another, just another student testimony. Um, Karen Miller tells us that she remembers protesting at the student union movie because it was not integrated. She was a freshman uh, in 1963. Wonderful. Is she on? On is she? Is she on the camera right now? You yeah. Mean? I mean, she sent it to me. Uh, I, I'm not sure. If... She can also speak up if anybody would like to say something. We can also. We'd love to hear you. Uh, but so so if you can queue up anyone who would like to speak, they can just write a message here saying I've got a comment or a question, and we'd love to hear it. But let's go on with Dave for a moment while anybody uh, okay. uh, nominates, because it would be wonderful, really, if you were actually there. And you're listening to us. We would love. This is the moment. Uh, Ted Bourne has to leave soon, but we'll be happy to to record uh, anybody who would like to speak. Go ahead with the Ranger experience. Well, it was just a the kind of experience where we were sort of popular figures. When the magazine came out every month, we would go out on the mall and and sell it. You know, have a table out there, and of course lots of clowns and buffoons would be associated and there would be music and it would, you know it was so it was like it was an interesting time and, and it was also it was and i think it was the last of that you know the, 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 after we got fired there was a, a little bit of a hiatus and then they were very careful about who they appointed as editor although what, the crazy thing is down the line they appointed gilbert shelton as the editor who was a wild man and uh but I think 74, didn't we discover that was the end of the Rangers gone? So uh, it's too bad. But but at the time, it was a big deal. And there was this, there was, of course, tension between the Ranger staff and the Texan staff, although I don't recall ever having, I mean, there were a whole bunch of these people were my friends who were reporters for the Texan and, and uh, David and Jim Hyatt and all these other people. Um, so anyway, the, the, the Texan was a really interesting, I mean, the Ranger was a very interesting experience that uh, But it was gone. being culturally crushed out. In a way, the UT Austin culture didn't really want this kind of, uh, uh, this, this mocking tone. There, there was, I mean, the same tone shows up in the Daily Texan. The issue was the Daily Texan wanted to retain its independence so that it wouldn't be controlled by the regents. Because if it did somehow fall within that, then the stories would be, we're doing great, we're number one at this, we're number one at that, someone won an award, isn't that lovely, everything's great, this is one of the, and, and they would write this, they were constantly fearing that this pressure from above was going to shut down the free speech that they were fighting for, that, that involved journalism, both journalism and humor. Well, the name of the article in the, in the Ranger that had the offensive words in it was about censorship. And so, and when you go but go look at these pages of when we were, Jeannie and I were doing this stuff, uh, almost every one of these things in the, on the editorial page is something by one of the Ranger writers writing in the Texan as editorials, either as Harry Ranger himself or as just firing line or, you know, whatever. And just wild people. I mean, just wild stuff in the Texan. So, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a cultural, I, I'm not sure this was, you, you say there was a cultural war against the Texan. I think it was a very small number of people in the administration sure. who just didn't want to do this mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah, but they probably were speaking for the uh, uh, quiet, silent majority that Ted is alluding to. Well, in other words, uh, yeah. just a big mass of people in Texas that represented what could be called the status quo. Right. And, and that phrase, the status quo, um, shows up in one of these pieces. I'm kind of wondering which one it is. This uh, It's this issue about the, the status quo is 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 there are people struggling to preserve it as long as they can because they love it. And then anything that kind of casts shade on it or ridicules it or undermines it or seeks to change it is, is, is a problem. Uh, here, I, I've just found the quotation about the, uh, about the, about the athletes, just, just this frustration that they had learning about the athletic integration at Lamar Tech. This is in the Texas. We couldn't help but remember what had been said about this university, UT Austin, being considerably in advance of what has in this area of integration occurred in public, private, and church-related related colleges elsewhere in Texas. We couldn't help remembering how incorrect this seemed when it was said last July, and it is becoming less correct 
all the time. Uh, that 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 kind of frustration. But um, has the Diana that you said as a person on that wrote to you directly volunteered to perhaps speak up? Uh, no, no word from anyone no. yet. All right. Um, uh, any other questions from people who are here? Or thoughts? I have a question. Go ahead. Are you saying that the first school that, that integrated athletics was Lamar State? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that several several schools in Texas, you know, they would that they would go. UT Austin students would go to another school to watch a football game or that another team would come here and there would be black athletes. And they'd be like, well, how come we don't have black athletes? Like, why are we, uh, I thought we were number one or pioneers or advancing. And they're like, that's not what we see here. There, there were- uh, It'd be interesting to know uh, big high schools like Lamar and Houston and others all over the state. When, when did they, decide they just had to have some black football players, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I wonder if it was before UT did that. Yeah. They were coming up through the high schools. The, uh, Diana, if you could put up a, the, the, the images again, just because we didn't see them, we just have a, a couple of images of those moments when, uh, when Dr. King uh, came to town, as was mentioned, there were very few photos. It's just a couple of the photos from online. So that's from the Daily Texan, just when it was announcing that the talk would happen next. Mm -hmm. This is him walking in a hallway, university hallway with a few people. Any idea of where that might be? Probably Union. Might be at the Union. Next. This is just a close-up. And then next. Jeannie, do you know that the photo by uh, Dratty or Dreddy, was that an actual Daily Texan person or is that a stock photo that may be no, it's a daily text. This is a daily text and photo from the event. Yes. Correct. Have you seen other photos from the event? Or is no, that, that one, one photo seen. is the one? Uh, they flipped it when they printed it, but it's it's from the event. Yeah. So we've been, going, Dr. May has been all through Briscoe. And it's just up in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no photos. You know, the other picture that you have from that walking down the hall mm -hmm. there, I don't recall it. My husband contends that is me. I don't know. I was going to ask. <laughs> oh, my gosh. No. That would make sense, really? Her husband, so what do you think, David? Yeah, 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 do you remember her looking that way? <laughs> your husband's a pretty good source. He met yeah, you the yeah, following yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. The following year, you don't think that's you? In other words, you, gotta ask why they else could it be? you have to ask why they'd allow a woman in this entourage. Yeah. <laughs> Unless it was the reporter. Especially on that age, is that something you would have worn? <laughs> You know, that looks like something you would have worn. Wish we it looks like we identify a lot of people in the photos. Uh, her husband is on campus right now, but didn't want to make her nervous by being here. Isn't that odd? Which is ridiculous yeah. after how many decades. It is ridiculous. All right, I think uh, uh, we, we do have one please. last comment yeah. from Craig Gowens. Um, so according to the New York Times, uh, the University of Texas admitted black students in 1956 but did not leave its ban on their playing varsity sports until 1963. Even then, Royal acknowledged there was tacit pressure from university regents for him not to rush to integrate the football team. And there's a link for the, for the story. That would have been Daryl Royal, I suppose. Yeah, sure. Because remember, when they won the national championship, what was that? I, I thought you said 63. 69 is, is Whittier, but did Whittier actually play in 69 or in 70? Mm -hmm. I mean, in 70 and 69, he's admitted into a team he plays in 70. Yeah, there might be a typo in the quotation of it says that the person was, was integrated earlier on. That's why it was not the football. Track, it was yeah. Track, yeah. I see. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just close it out with uh, one last thought. Um, uh, I have here, it was the Daily Texan series on inadequate, inadequate Negro housing at UT, which opened a year long campus campaign to provide UT students with the privileges of first class citizenship. That's a quotation from uh, either the Daily Texas or the, or the Cactus, the, 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 an, the annual book of our university. Thank you all for being with us and uh, for participating in this event. And uh, thank you to the audience online. It's been very delightful. And I say thank you to the Daily Texan for being there when they had this. <laughs>